But uh, it's, it's exciting where we are at in the plan of God and the will of God and the timing of God and everything that's going on, on in our world today. And, and I'm just expecting some great things. Amen. And while that we look at... Um, while we look at the situation sometimes, and we even look at the Scripture, and the Scripture bears out that, you know, there's going to be a time when it's going to be a little difficult. There's going to be some falling away. But at the same time, it speaks about there's going to be some great revival. And uh, it speaks about how that there's going to be adversaries and opposition. But at the same time, there's going to be great open doors, amen, and God working with us and, and God working in His people. So while that the... Uh, you know, while that the, the clouds may come in, there's, there's that light, amen, of the, the power of God and the work of God and the will of God. And so I'm excited about what God is doing, amen. And it's good to have everyone that's come out to the house of the Lord today. We're glad that you're here in this adult Sunday school class. And without any further ado, knowing that the clock is officially ticking, I am going to move right to the book of Genesis chapter number 37. Amen. I've asked this question before uh, at the beginning of preaching that uh, how many of you have ever been offended? Let's, let's know. How many of you have ever been offended? Let's just kind of lift it up a little bit. Yeah, we all. And then uh, I always follow the question up with how many of you have been offensive? <laughs> and, you know, we kind of fall into that category too. Um, though we don't try to be either of those, right? We, we don't like to, to be offended, and, and I, I believe today that we do not want to be offensive. But uh, sometimes it just happens, and it takes place. And we're going we're gonna to go into some of that uh, here today just for a few minutes. Genesis 37, verses 3 through 5. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Well, there's a big problem, right? Right from the get-go. He loved... <laughs> You can see some offenses coming up already, can't you? Uh, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Uh, you that are the oldest in the family, <clears throat> you kind of got the brunt of the uh, new uh, parenting, uh, you know, the, the new parent that just got into it, you know. So all of your pictures were taken, right? You, all of your pictures were taken. And uh, so... Uh, by the time you get down to the fifth one, you know, there's hardly any pictures at all a lot of times. And, um, and that's just kind of the way it works. But in, in this situation here, we see that, uh, you know, Joseph was the son of his old age. And he was one of those, you know, that's down on the, you know, the youngest and all of that kind of thought. And the Bible says he made him a coat of many colors. <clears throat> And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren. Let me just, I want to share a little story. For, for nine years in our family, it was four brothers. Um, I was the youngest, okay? I was the youngest for nine years. And uh, that really wasn't that bad. I, I capitalized on that as much as I possibly could as a, you know, as a nine-year-old. And um, then my, my brother came along. And messed everything up. And, and I can remember losing that position because he became the, the, the youngest. And, you know, he's only, you know, he's only three. He's only, yeah, right, but he just hit me in the head with a hammer, okay? It's like, yeah, but he's only three. <clears throat> so I, I bear the bumps and bruises of those times when that the youngest kind of uh, took my place. And I'm offended. No. <laughs> his father loved him more than all his brethren, and they hated him. The, uh, the brethren hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Genesis 37, 19 through 20, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Genesis 37, verses 23 through 25. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, 
his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and they cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And then Genesis 42 and verse number 9, at least uh, the part of that, it says, and Joseph remembered the dreams. And Joseph remembered the dreams. Now, now Joseph didn't really do anything wrong, did he? But he was hated by his brothers because he... Brother Solomon, I, I failed to recognize you being here with us in this Sunday school class. I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> and we'll make mention of it in our 11 o'clock service. He's going to be preaching to us. Praise God. Sorry. Uh, Joseph did nothing wrong. But he was hated by his, his brothers because he had this dream. And his coat indicated the favor of his father, and they were envious of that. If you have a dream, or you have been pleased, or, or you have been blessed by God, and you are pleasing to God, um, and, and I, I could ask you today, how many of you have some dreams that, that God has put into your life? Some dreams, we may call them aspirations or callings, or what we feel like God would actually do with us, and, and how He would work in our life, Amen. And a calling isn't just necessarily a call for you to preach. That, that's, that's not what I'm, I'm, I'm just referring to here, but the call to be what God wants you to be. And uh, we are a body fitly framed together, and we all can't be preachers, right? We, all can't be, we, all, we cannot all be Sunday school teachers. Now, now, we can all be soul winners in one frame or fashion by being a witness for what God has done in our life. But, but all the, the, the intricate parts of church and life and all of that, we cannot all be the same thing. And God wants us to be who He wants us to be. He doesn't want you to be me, and He doesn't want me to be you. He wants us to be together as the body of Christ. Amen. Now, Joseph has this dream, has this favor, has this blessing upon his life. But settle it in your mind, even though you have dreams and you have favor and you have blessings and all of that, that someone somewhere is going to have a problem with that. Everybody say, a problem with that. Help me out now. A problem with that. All right. Joseph's brothers schemed to take away that blessing and that dream. And God let them do it. God let them do it. And, and I'm thinking, no, 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 wait, wait a minute here. Time out. This, this doesn't happen this way. Or if, if you're going to take it from me, if you're going to, if you're going to rob me, then you're going to do it with a, with a big fight, okay? Right? And God let them do this. Now, the Bible says that we have various kinds of problems here on earth, and any of you that do not have any problems, you could raise your hand and you could actually stand up and tell us how you're doing it. Okay? Um, we have problems and situations to, do, to deal with. Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. And so that's the only place we're going to have fi find peace. We, we'll have peace in the storm, but we'll have the storms. And we can have peace in the problems, but we'll have problems and situations. And he said, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Basically, he's telling us that, yes, tribulation, problems and situation, but don't let that really truly, you know, get you. Uh, remember, I have overcome the world, and because he has overcome the world, we will overcome the world as well. Now, some problems come to us simply because we're human. Say, I am human. I am human. Some are more human than others. <laughs> Matthew 4, 45 and 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And problems just come to us because we are human. Other situations and problems.
problems are specific. I believe that there's uh, specific to believers. And we, we read about the attacks of Satan, the fiery darts that will come against us. And we are able to quench those fiery darts by the shield of faith. Amen. And uh, the, the Bible lets t- us to know, 1 Peter 5 and 8, it says, be sober. Now, you can, you know, you can be drunk on more things than just, um, you know, wine or something of that nature. Uh, the, the Bible lets us, know, lets us know not to be overtaken with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Sometimes all of that, that care will just come upon you. Before you know it, you're intoxicated by all of those worries and frets and problems and situations that you're dealing with. Be sober and be vigilant. Be aware. Know what's going on around you. Realize that you don't have any kind of a friendship with an enemy called Satan. There's no friendship there at all. Now, he comes to you as an angel of light, and he will appear to you to be your friend, but he's not your friend, okay? You just mark it down. But, but he did this. He said this. He said that. Uh, you know, this happened, that happened. No, he is not your friend and never will be. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. We could talk about these things for a long time. Could be this just this one verse. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now I've heard people say that a roaring lion doesn't really have any teeth to bite you with. But you know what? If I'm facing that roaring lion. I'm probably not going to sit there and try to you know see if that's the case. Uh, I'm, you know I'm making my escape, getting you know wherever I can. Because uh, I'm not going to just trust somebody else's. Old, they don't have any teeth. They don't have any bite. Or whatever. Well, they sure don't look like they do. But anyway, <laughs> seeking whom he may devour. Let's me to know that he can't devour everyone. And if he could, we'd all be devoured for sure because we are believers. Say, I am a believer. So you, you're, you're a believer today and the, the adversary has this target placed upon you. And he's wanting to destroy you. And if he could, if he could, if he could, he would. Amen. There's no doubt in my mind that I stand here today because of the hand of God and the mercy and the grace of God and that my life is in his hand. Because if it was not in God's hand, Satan would already have killed me. Seeking whom he may devour. Specific to believers. But the problems that we find hardest to understand and hardest to cope with and are those problems that we have to deal with that come from those that are the closest to us, all right? It makes a difference what my wife says to me compared to what you may say to me because she is much closer to me than what you are. And you can say A, B, C. And I can say D, E, F. And it, it doesn't necessarily affect me as much as if my wife says or your husband says A, B, C. You know what I'm saying. And you, it, it's different when your boss says A, B, C. And, and the closer that you get into relationships, that's where the, the problem becomes more difficult and the hurt be, gets deeper. And we find in the scripture that there's a, there's a problem, situa- there's, a, there's a hurt that will come to us simply because... You are a brother or sister in the Lord to someone. Psalm 55. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Because if it was, then I could have borne it. He's saying, I, I, you know, this guy that's over here and he's shooting arrows at me. He's across the, you know, he's across the great divide and all of that. And, and he's shooting arrows at me. Oh, I can, I can deal with that. I can shoot an arrow back. But while I was standing on my own side, I got stabbed in the back. It was friendly fire. Different story. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then would I have hid myself from him. 
But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God and company. He said, those are the ones that really hurt us. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can hurt me. You can hurt me. Mm -hmm. And now, now turn to them and say this, you can help me. That's right. You, you, you can hurt me. Or you can help me. You can curse me or you can bless me. You can hate me. You can love me. These are all choices and, and such that, that we, we have to make toward one another. And I pray and I hope that with each of us that, that we can be a help and not a hurt and a, and a love and not a hate and a help. To each and every one of our brothers and sisters. Now, the, 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 the Bible calls this type of problem an offense. And the Greek word scandalon means a stumbling block. And that's where this comes from. Or something that would cause one to fail. Something that's scandalous in my opinion. Something that is contrary to expectations that brings great disappointment. I didn't ever think that you would do that to me, right? I, I, I never thought that, you know, I, I'm used to attacks and I'm, a, I'm used to those, those fiery darts and I'm used to that. But I never expected that to come from you. It's that, uh, that offense that's kind of the trigger of a trap. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. So we might as well come to the conclusion that offenses are going to come. But woe unto him through whom they come. So if offenses are going to come, then, then what do we do? And what can we do about those types of situations? So it's how we deal with it that's going to change the impact or, uh, you know, if, if it's really truly something that's fatal uh, to, a, to an ind individual. It's something that's deadly. But if the, if the, uh, the offense and the way that we deal with things... If we're not careful, it becomes much more harmful and it will become much more fatal. It will, it will bring us to that place. Offenses will come, but offense is like the bait in a trap. It's not the trap in itself, but it's just the bait and, and it gets you to go into the trap and uh, really it's harmless unless we feed on it. That's, that's, what, that's how bait works. You know, it kind of, you know, if you're the bear, yogi out there in the woods, and you smell something sweet and savory out there somewhere in the woods, and someone's taken a bunch of old Dunkin' Donuts, and they placed it out there and slathered some molasses on it or something, and they're sitting up in a tree waiting, just waiting for someone, or someone uh, some bear to, to take the bait. All right, the aroma's there and, and all of that, and that bear makes its way to that particular uh, location and begins to feed on that bait. And that's, that's where the, the problem is. That's where you're in extreme danger, and that's where you can lose your life, amen, and it becomes deadly. It is a fact of human nature that the closer the relationship, the more severe the offense The closer the relationship, the more severe the offense. The most vicious legal cases are those which we call D-I-V-O-R-C-E. Those divorces that are very, very vicious. Do you, do you know that, uh, that, one, that probably the, 
the most dangerous place for a police officer to enter into into a situation. Not, not necessarily a bank robbery or even a, a terrorist, you know, type uh, thing going on. Or, or, you know, even though these things have become more and more dangerous, you know, a traffic stop and this, that, and the other. But the most dangerous ones are those domestic those domestic fights that are going on. Yes, and that police officer, police officer tries to get in there and, and try to settle things down. And, and before you know it, uh, you know, uh, they're both against him. <laughs> right? And domestic uh, fighting and such becomes much more dangerous because the closer the relationships the more severe the offense. Jesus said it is impossible to live in this life and not have the opportunity to be offended. So the question is not, will you enter or will you, will you, will you be offended? Is when you enter into that situation, will you, will you get into this trap and be caught? So you will encounter this trap. You will. You will encounter this trap. How will you respond to it? So let's ask ourselves this question out loud. How will I respond to it? How will I respond to it? Now, one of the signs of the end time is that many will be offended. Matthew 24, and then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise, and many shall, and, and many shall be deceived. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Let's just say, I'm going to endure to the end. I'm going to endure to the end. Now, you've got to notice that Jesus warns of false prophets immediately after his prophecy of many of us being offended. And he called those false prophets wolves. And they're wolves because they prey on the wounded. Right? You take the time to look at those, you know, National Geographic magazines or videos or things of that nature. And you see the hungry lion and he's looking for the calf. He's looking for the weakest, or he's looking for the oldest because they can't get away, you know? And neither one of them have the ability to truly fight for themselves, you know, in comparison. They're not looking for the, you know, the beefy critter over there that's, you know, able to fight back. But they're looking for the calf. They're looking for the elderly. They're looking for the wounded. And they, they are looking for opportunity. Everyone say opportunity opportunity and they prey on the wounded because they're not able to handle the healthy and your adversary will come along and he's seeking whom he may devour and these false prophets come as wolves looking for the wounded the young false prophets you know what they do? They tell people what they want to hear. False prophets are going to tell you what you want to hear. Everybody say, what I want to hear. <laughs> While the real prophet is going to speak to you, not necessarily from the standpoint of what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And, and I, want, I want to hear what I need to hear. And so, offended people are easy prey because they are wounded. Now, strong cities of ancient time had walls. And those walls were built for protection. They kept out the unwelcome, right? Those invaders that would come along. And therefore, as they were asking to enter in, this walled city had gates, gatekeepers... And they were screened as they went to the city to get in. You know, they, they stood in the booth and, and they were screened. And they were 
whether or not they were able to come in, that they didn't have some form of weapon that they could use against the inhabitants of the city if they owed taxes. Everyone say taxes. If I'm not mistaken, is that tomorrow or Thursday uh, or Tuesday? Got some extra days over the... Anyway, uh, taxes... And if they did not and had not as of yet paid their taxes, oh, pay up and we'll let you come in. That's how, they, how it worked. So they kept the unwelcome invaders out. They kept those that, that owed taxes. Anyone that was considered a threat to the city's health or safety were kept out. Proverbs 18 and 19, a brother offend is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. And uh, what we do many times is we construct walls when we are hurt, right? To safeguard our hearts and prevent any future wounds, right? You fool me once, shame on you. But if you fool me twice, it's shame on me. And so I'm going to build those walls as big and as tough as I possibly can because I didn't like it the first time you fooled me. And I sure is not going to give you the chance to fool me again. And so <laughs> I was going to have one of you come up, but this is, this is a person right here. Now, I love you. Just want you to know I love you. And have a good day. Yes, great to see you again. But we keep them at arm's length, right? Because they've hurt us. They've hurt us. And these are things that are difficult to deal with, and all of us have to do it. But... Always keeping somebody at arm's length forever. You know, I, I can understand being a little, you know, maybe concerned <laughs> or something of that nature for a period of time or, or something like that and, and such, but forever. You know, just have that wall built tough and strong and you're never ever going to get back into my life ever again. I, I don't really see that that's a, a, a real good way to to do things because the walls that we build that restrict the access of people getting to us and the filters that we set up so that if you know we think somebody owes us something that that kind of keeps them out um, you know we, we kind of withhold any kind of access to these people until they have paid up right with interest. <laughs> and I won't go into that. But anyway, when you pay up, I'll let you back in. But the problem with this way of dealing with problems and situations is that potentially our walls of protection become our own prison. And at that point, we are not only cautious about who comes in, but so in terror of future injuries that we don't let anyone come in. And beyond that, it gets to the place that we cannot venture outside of our own fortress. And if left unchecked, like I say, those walls become a prison. And those walls of offense not only become a prison, but it's a prison of bitterness. Hebrews 12 and 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble, springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. If roots are nursed, watered, protected, fed, given attention, what they do is they increase in depth, don't they? And they increase in and strength. If not dealt with quickly, those roots are hard to pull up. 
freshly, you know, uh, plowed or harrowed or tilled ground. You know, when you, you till that ground and, and those weeds first come up, they're pretty easy to pick out. You can usually get those out quite quickly. But if you neglect it and just let the, you know, let the spring turn to summer and all of that, and you get out there, man, those weeds are really needing to be, you know, be picked, pulled up. And you start pulling and tugging, and anything good in the ground is removed with it because of the, the root system that's in those weeds. And you end up doing more harm than good. And so, allowing uh, an offense to fester, you know, it, yeah, it hurts, and there's a splinter there. And uh, if you leave it there, it's not going to get better. It's just basically going to get worse. And, you know, you, hopefully, if you can, you're, you're able to, to pull that splinter out. Yeah. I've had splinters many times, so have you on the job site and this, that, and the other, and you're looking for something, I'll, I'll take my utility knife out and I'll get that thing out of my, yeah. my finger. Now, that might not be the most sanitary way of doing it, but I'm getting that thing out of my, my hand. I'm not dealing with that for the rest of the day, poking me constantly while I'm trying to do what I, you know, what I need to do. So I get it out of there as quickly as I possibly can. And then I wrapped some electrical tape around it. Anyway... <laughs> Hebrews 12, 15 looking diligently lest any man fail the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled so if they're nursed and watered and protected they only get worse Francis Frank Payne said bitterness is unfulfilled revenge imagine how different Joseph's story would have been if he had yielded to the course of offense but Joseph refused to let another person's sin affect his relationship with God or the dream that God had given to him. <sighs> Joseph, for a short period of time, lost sight of his blessing or could have. I mean, I'm just on the outside looking in at Joseph's situation. But I would, I would suppose that that he was, um, he was upset and he was hurt and probably lost sight of that dream for a while, at least temporarily. But he still had to choose the right response. And he chose to forgive. If Joseph had been offended and allowed that offense to be rooted in his life and spirit, he would have later killed his brothers. That's why it's talked about in there. That's why they were afraid, because they realized just how, how powerful offense is and how long it can live. And that's why they were, that's why they were worried. Because they understood that if Joseph so desired, he could have had them all killed. And so, instead of rehearsing that offense, he chose to reverse that offense. Now, here we are today, and many of you, I am sure, have been offended in one frame or fashion in your life, and Maybe it's a parent that's abused you. Maybe it's a spouse that's abused you or children that have, you know, just kind of shaken their fist at you. And I would, I would, uh, I would encourage you, and though this is not the easiest thing to do, I'd remind you of the, the words of Joseph. Would you stand with me? Where he said, as, as they're all together now and they're worried about their future and Jesus I mean and Joseph uh, looks at them and says you know I, I know you all thought evil against me I'm not going to I'm not going to deny that I'm not going to you know say that didn't happen it did happen 
I think one of the, I think one of the worst things that we can do is just ignore a, a, a problem, to ignore a mistake. If you made a mistake, you know, admit the mistake, correct it if you possibly can, right? I mean, to me, if you take a test and, and you get 70% and, and, and there you got those three that are wrong, that, wouldn't it be advantageous for you to look at those equations and, and fix them and, and make them right? And the next time that test comes out, hey, it was more than a 70, it was a, it was a 100%. So one of the worst things we can do is just say, well, it didn't happen. I didn't do anything. The best way is to, to face it, though it's not easy at times to face. But I did wrong. And I'm asking for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. Now, that's, that's the right way to, to approach this. But there's another part of that. As brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we've got to be able to look at that individual and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Because forgiveness is the only cure for the offense. And when we forgive, we release the power of God to bring good out of a bad situation. Because Romans 8 and 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. If we're not careful, when we often do this, we assign blame to somebody else. If it wasn't, if, if it wasn't for what you did, then I would be able to. And my disappointment is their fault. But the reality is this. No man or devil can get you out of the will of God. No man or devil can make you to be lost. That's totally up to us. It's up to me. It's up to you. Only you can thwart the will of God in your life by being disobedient, by being offended. Allowing that offense to, to take you down and bitterness and all of that. So Joseph lost his first coat in a time of real tribulation. Anyone that says that Joseph was not upset about what was happened, you need to read the, you need to read the, uh, the story closely and the words of the brothers that said, oh yeah, we, we saw the anguish of his heart. Yeah, we saw that. Joseph wasn't just sitting there saying, oh well, thank you Jesus, you know. No, there was anguish in that heart. They saw it. So the first coat's taken by that tribulation, but ultimately we see the forgiveness. But I just want you to know that the plan of God, especially in Joseph's life, as one was taken, another one was presented. One coat was taken and then another coat is presented. One coat. It's kind of like that first coat was the primer. Any of you painters? Prime in a way. Just getting things started. And then that's covered by the second coat. And the third coat. Depends how, you know, fussy you are. But then there's always the finished coat. The final coat. And that final coat is applied. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. <laughs> and Pharaoh took off his ring, put it on Joseph's hand. The Bible says, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen. What was that? It was a coat. It was a robe. It was another dimension of God's favor and blessing upon his life and the fulfillment of a dream. The fulfillment of a dream. He's faithful, folks. He's faithful. Remember the dreams that God has given to you. Let's just worship the Lord. Your He's been faithful, faithful to me. Oh, looking back, His love and mercy. Oh, yeah. 
see. Hallelujah. I see. Do you see it today? Thank you, Lord. Right now, somebody be restored, amen, in the Lord right now. Faithful Hallelujah. to me. Oh, looking back, His love and mercy. I see. Oh, God, help me, Lord Jesus, today. Is my heart. I have questions. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Faithful. Faithful. 